All righty. Well, welcome. It's good to uh, have folks joining us on Facebook or a day or two later on YouTube. Um, we're glad you're there. And we're going to be studying the book of Acts, chapter 12. Maybe a short one again. It, it, you know, I keep thinking that every now and then. It's pretty straightforward, but then sometimes we get all kinds of yes. downloads and stuff. So we'll, we'll see. But it's definitely a pretty straightforward chapter, so. Yes. Um, saying that, we'll go ahead and jump in. Uh, and we're going to just break it in, in the logical blocks here. Sam, so uh, we're following along chapter 12, verse 1 through 5. Hi. James is killed and Peter is imprisoned. About that time, King Herod, Herod Agrippa, Agrippa, yep. Agri Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with killed with a sword. When Herod Her Herod Herod. Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people. He also arrested Peter. This took place during the Passover celebration. Then he imprisoned him, placing him under the guard of four Squad. squads of four soldiers each. Her Herod, Herod? Mm -hmm. yep. intended to bring Peter out for a public trial after the Passover. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly. For him. Alright. That seemed a little tougher than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Shut up. No, I'm just making a comment. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, so this is a pretty traumatic. I mean, we only get, what, two sentences, and we've already got an apostle that James is, is killed. Um, and then I, I think one of the main things that really kind of uh, jumped out at me with this passage, and, I, and just to be honest, in, in, when I was younger in the faith, I, I, I read a lot faster. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so yeah. I, you read through these things, and you go, okay, I don't know that. you know, and you just get. Sometimes it seems like you get through larger chunks of the text before something really kind of grab, grabs your spirit. But I, I, I don't know if I'm just old and slow, but I, I tend to read slower. And, and so I've never had anything jump out of this sorry, little so block late. here. <laughs> hey, Pastor Kim. Hey, sorry I'm um, late. We just started. We're, you're, you're good. We I'm, just started I'm the first part. coughing and stuff, so I was debating whether I should come, but I'm just going to take cough drops. Get your bimac and then again. <laughs> just in case. Just in case. Whatever it is, it'll knock me out. <laughs> Keep going, Alan. Go ahead. So, so um, so this thing jumped out at me, and, 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 and one and at once kind of surprised me. But then I was like, it shouldn't really surprise me because this has been going on through the Old Testament, and that is this concept here that what Herod's doing, persecuting the church, um, killing James, imprisoning Peter. He's, his motivation is because he, he's getting he's getting the accolades mm -hmm. from the priests. That, the Jewish priest, mm -hmm. right? So he's doing it for his personal gain, basically. So yep. it's just that concept of his intentions and what what his was in his heart when he was doing something and what's motivating his heart is, is what I thought that really jumped out at me because it, like I said, again, it struck me as a little bit of a surprise. But then I go back and go, well, I mean, even back down through, you know, David, don't look at the outside. I look at the heart. Mm -hmm. I look at what what your intention. Those guys look at that throughout the entire. Throughout the entire scripture, pretty much. Yeah. So it shouldn't be a surprise that that's some of the stuff that's revealed to us here. Um, but again, I, I just, like I said, I always just read through it. It was pretty straightforward. James got killed. Peter got in prison. Let's move on with other things, you know. Um, mm. But again, it just kind of popped on me. It was like, he's really just, he's doing this because he's seeking his own glory. Mm -hmm. And he's found an action that a certain group of people will give him glory if he continues to do. So yeah. that's that's what he, that's what he's doing. Yeah. Helps keep the peace and keeps Rome happy. Mm -hmm. He's a Roman puppet. Well, yeah. It's specifically, the the passion says when Herod realized how much this pleased the Jewish leaders, he had Peter arrested. And we know from the other end of the chapter 
you know, he, he is receiving it's that, know, it, yeah. that worship, literally. Yeah, it's, it, it's the, uh, the growth in it, being, you know, um, that concept of wanting personal glory mm -hmm. um, it grew out of hand mm -hmm. toward the end of the chapter. Um, yeah, because I, I, I like how you're viewing that with an issue to motive because wasn't that many chapters before. Here's Paul killing Christians. Yeah. He comes to a different end than Agrippa. Exactly. And I, that's the, that's, that's, I love how Bible study has this discussion because that's just another facet of that. And you look at that and you really analyze it, it was a horrible thing that Saul had done. Right. But from his heart, he was doing it trying to please God. Right. He wasn't doing it to bring himself glory. Yep. Um, and so God took the handlebars of the bicycle of his life and said, I'm going to steer you a different direction. Yeah. Because I think you want to do the right thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and the whole concept of, I'm going to hold Peter until after Passover again, plays right into that. I, I want to make it, now he's trying to make it. So I got the impression he just killed James. And then when he found out how much it, he got glory for it, he said, oh, oh wait, let's, let's, we're going to make a show out of it now. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's build the big stage and we're going to, you know, so, uh, you know, we're doing it after Passover. Everybody's going to be here. We're going to get, you know, so he's just, now he's, he's playing the game with someone's life. Great. Yeah. But I mean, you know, yeah, he's playing, he, yeah. Mm -hmm. He's basically going to say, I'm going to milk it for everything I can get, basically. Yeah. Yeah, Jerusalem was probably the most full right after Passover. And, and it does remind me, too, of, uh, as much as I don't, I don't want to devolve into a lot of political stuff, but I just see so much from both sides of the aisle where you go, dude, it is so clear you're doing this for yourself. Yeah. You don't care one wick about who it's going to hurt in the public, or who it's going to benefit, or who's you know, got to pay for it, or any of those things. Yeah. It's all political crap. Yeah. You know, and the political crap, when I, that term for me basically means you're trying to line your own pockets, either with money or with, you know, accolades or, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of stuff, the glory of, of other people. Coming yeah. You, you know. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if, if this kind of dynamic were true today, I'm not sure many people would actually make it to Washington. The whole eaten by worms would probably kick in a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, and we definitely have, you know, I think God is stirring his people. I think a righteous response to some of what we're seeing at this point is just mind blowing is to say, Lord, we need you to show up in power because, you know, our country's going down the tubes. So, I'm investing in other farms. <laughs> well, and it's, <coughs> it's hard to not respond when, when you see stuff that's evil, when you see stuff that's self-serving, but are we responding biblically? Are we responding the way God responds? Um, and, and to some measure with some holy fear, because it's life and death. You know, that's what I was saying when I <coughs> went to put the blurb together for Facebook um, about Bible study. I was like, well, it, it's this angel goes to jail to get Peter out, book ended by two deaths. Yeah. And went, I'm not sure I ever really saw this chapter that way before, but it's life and death, yeah. you know, and deliverance from death. So, yep. I mean, we have to pray for God's will in every situation because we don't know if He's going to take anybody else and have a Saul Paul conversion. Right. So you might think the guy needs to be eaten by worms yep. yesterday, but it might not be God's plan. So you just have to pray into it and step back as much as that's very difficult. Yeah. Yeah, inviting God in. Again, if God's all about partnership, and, and increasingly here at Harvest, we just continue to see that, oh, he wants us in the yoke with him. He doesn't want to do this himself. Acts chapter 1 is God partnering with Adam and Eve. You know, And if he wants us to partner, then we invite him in. And Scripture is really clear. We're supposed to pray for everybody in authority. Yep. Let's pray for everybody who has those responsibilities. And some people do it well, some people do not do it well. Some people do it with a motive to serve, some people are benefactors of the people. Well, anything else? Let's, again, it's just a few verses here, but you know, there's a lot going on here when you really dig into it. Mm -hmm. And this plus the end of the chapter, um, I've got to 
theological hangry, I may pull the pin off. Ah. Uh -oh. Depending on how much how much time we have. At the and end. then you'll run out of town. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, I'll pull the pin and then Pastor Tom will clean it up after. Sure, you know. yeah. <laughs> that guy. Um, verse 5 in the Passion, the church went into a season of intense intercession. Oh, yeah. Asking God to free him. Am I stealing your, your footnote? Is, is, I'm not sure. I wanted to ask you because you're probably got a better ground on it. Is this, is this one of the first times after, after Jesus' death that we really see the, uh, like a group intercession like this? Other than Pentecost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that they prayed. Uh, Acts chapter 3, they get persecuted after they heal the guy and they gather in prayer and lift their voice but this is for somebody's deliverance that's, that's kind of yeah it's yeah, very it's specific a, you know yeah they have a real real focused goal in mind I, I, it really struck me the uh, passions footnote says the Greek phrase used here for intense intercession means to stretch tightly in prayer mm -hmm. and I, I've I've been through some of those seasons, certainly through the years, um, but I'm having some some fresh um, stretching in prayer would be accurate. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the fact that it's called a season, you know, probably as soon as he was arrested, they were there. So I don't know. That makes me wonder um, how long was he in prison? You know, the, yeah. we don't get those details on the timeline of you know when James was killed. And, when Peter was arrested and how long he was in jail. Well, it's, it's, it definitely clearly says he was taken um, during the, the Feast of Passover. Mm -hmm. So you've got those few days there. So it's probably a couple of days that he was in prison, right. uh, I would guess, because they were waiting to the end of, of Passover. Right. Yeah, um, let's get the religious stuff done, then we'll do the execution yeah. while the crowd's still here. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I, I just, I, I see that, and I, I think that part of what's going on, specifically in the church in America, is you know if God allows everything that happens and, and that we could spend a long time down that rabbit trail but where we're at as a country to me in many ways echoes the book of Acts that you're going feels like we're a bit occupied feels like somebody has an agenda and it's not about serving the common people um, are we going to proclaim the kingdom or are we going to have good news to bring and um, are we really going to pray for that transformation? Um, I, I, I personally think that the body of Christ for quite a long time in the United States wanted to keep the comfort zone that they had. We had become a little bit like the religious leaders in that we don't want things to change because we like the way it, it's going. Um, and I can say as a pastor, it, it's nice when the fashionable thing is for people to go to church. You know. And that, that's kind of the norm that's culturally relevant. Um, when church falls out of fashion, like it has to some measure in the last few years, you know, it, it's, it's difficult if you're counting nickels and noses. But I think there's a purification going on, just like there was in the book of Acts. When this is the price, when people are starting to be killed, when people are being driven out, being a believer is not convenient anymore. And uh, yeah. there's a, a purifying that goes on. We're being called upon to partner more and participate more. We can't just sit back and wait. God will fix it. He'll just rapture us out of here. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to do yeah. anything. And that's not where we're at. And people are not comfortable. Well, people keep pushing the eject button, but it's not hooked up. So, you know, all my Christian life, I, I watched Kim not do her homework because she was raised Adventist and told Jesus was coming back soon. And we need to just get over hoping God will take us out. And we need to be working and training as if it's going to go on well beyond us. Mm -hmm. It was a mini-sermon. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I'm glad you brought that up because I was getting ready to forget about it. But there was something else I wanted to say. You, you had mentioned that concept either last week or the week before. Um, and this is this the, the intercession is probably not something that came up in this light, like you know, tithing or what have you. But we, we talked about that concept of some things that didn't make it through the cross, right? Some things that got changed coming through the cross, and some things that made it through the cross. Intercession <coughs> is definitely made it through the cross, mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, it's it's something that works. Mm -hmm. 
if you do it. <laughs> yes. So anyway, but I just that was that concept of this is one of those things pretty clear. Mm -hmm. I think you've got the intercession of the church, and then this next block we're going to read is where I believe God's partnering with 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 the church and the intercession. Yeah. You, you see the results of what's happening. Here. Yeah. Uh, and of course, this is on this side of the covenant, so you know, made through the, made through the cross. Yeah, and there are without any question some pretty pretty good highlight reel moments in the Old Testament of somebody praying and God responding. So I would absolutely agree. Intercession is one of those concepts that made it through the cross and yep. was, was valid on both sides. Alrighty. Anything else in this little lock there? Alright. Sam, you ready? You yeah. might have to take a deep breath on this one because we're going to go from uh, verse 6 to verse 19. <laughs> The night before Peter was planned was was to be placed on trial. He was asleep, fastened with two chains between two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. Suddenly there was a bright light in the cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, Quick, get up! And the chains fell off his wrists. Then the angel told him, Get dressed and put on your sandals. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me. The angel ordered him. So Peter left the cell, following the angel, but all, all the time he thought it was a vision. He didn't realize it was actually happening. They passed the first and second guard post and came to the iron gate leading to the city, and this opened for them all by itself. So they passed through and started walking down the street, and then the angel suddenly left him. Peter finally came to his senses. It's really true, he said. The Lord has sent his angel and saved me from, the, from, from Herod and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do for me. When he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. He knocked at the door in the gate, and a servant girl named Rhoda, Rhoda, Rhoda came to open it. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the door, she ran back inside to everyone. Peter is standing at the door! You're out of your mind, they said, which he insisted. They decided it must be his angels, his angel. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking. When they finally opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. He motioned them for them to quiet down and told them how the Lord had led him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers what happened, he said. And then he went to another place. At dawn, there was a great commotion among the soldiers of that, about what had happened to Peter. Hurrah, Herod, Herod, and... Herod Agrippa. Herod Agrippa ordered a thorough, thorough search for him. When he couldn't be found, Herod interrogated the guards and sentenced them to death. Afterward, Herod left Judea to stay in Caesarea for a while. <clears throat> So, this is, if we remember, uh, Peter went, a couple chapters ago, he had that vision of the, the cloth coming down with, with all the animals on it. And of course it came multiple times, and I'm assuming that that was a judging by the scripture and also by Peter's reaction here, that that was a, not like a fuzzy vision, it was like he was there, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, to have experienced that kind of vision from God, it's not too out of the ordinary for him to think that this is all, because this is some crazy stuff happening. Yeah. An angel shows up, his chains are falling off, the gates are opening up, nobody can see him walking around. So, you know, it, it, he's already had these visions. He's, you know, so he's thinking, this is just another vision. What's God trying to show me this time? You know, yeah. uh, And am I going to have time to figure it out before, you know, before they kill me? Yeah. Before they kill me. Uh, and then suddenly the angel's gone. Just <laughs> at it. This is actually happening. Yeah. He he forgot the time honored tradition of pinching himself to see if, you know, <laughs> if he was awake. <laughs> uh, but it's just it, it's amazing 
that this is the answer to the prayer. And this is not the first time, or not the only time, that God breaks the chains off of people. Yeah. Um, in the New Testament. Um, so you talk about something that came through, or even was a consequence of the cross, mm-hmm. and breaking of chains mm. in more ways than one. Mm. That's good. Mm-hmm. Like that Peter was so comfortable with whatever his fate was going to be. He took off his shoes, he took off his robe, he went night night in the jet, chains on. Yeah. Just trusted that whatever was happening, it was part of God's plan, and, and mm-hmm. he was just at peace with it enough to be able to sleep soundly in a jail mm-hmm. with a sword hanging over his head. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> And then he gets to the door. You're here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, around? No. <laughs> so Peter said, "Okay, now I'm out. It's real." So he heads to Mary's, and this is the this is the thing that is funny. That these are people who you know uh, lived uh, in the time that Jesus actually walked the earth. They've seen. They're they're living in the time of the Book of Acts, where you're seeing miracles happen all over the place. Okay. People are doing all kinds of stuff. They're healing people, throwing, throwing demons out. And so they're praying for Peter to get let out of prison. And yet, the expectancy is not there. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I something uh, my mom told me when I was really little was that whenever you have something to do, you should, you should pray as if it's all in God's hands, but work as if it's all in your hands. Mm-hmm. And then that partnership kind of comes together. But there's something else I learned about prayer is that you can't just go through the motions. Mm. Prayer is not about just spouting off some words. It should be a communication. There's a, there should be an intimacy there. But when you're when you're seeking out something like this, where there's a clear injustice, mm. and you're interceding for someone. And that could be, you know, your your grandkid, mm-hmm. you know, getting out of the, the prison of drugs. Mm-hmm. It could be, there's all kinds of stuff. There should be an expectancy of prayer mm-hmm. that is going to be answered. Mm-hmm. You should pray and expect God to want to move with you. Yeah. And, and I believe that's part of how your faith works, how, mm-hmm. how it all comes together. Um, but here you don't see, you don't see it. You don't. See, they're, they're so the the maid that goes to open the door doesn't even open the door. She recognizes his voice, and you know I have the picture in my head of my granddaughters. Oh my goodness, they're like what five or six. Yo, I mean they have the attention span of that that long. Yes. It was Peter like, running to tell him. Did you open the door? Nothing like that. You know why would we want to do that? That doesn't make any sense. Let's go tell him. Um, but um, just that concept of oh my gosh, Peter's here. How could he be here? Right. Well, you were just praying for him to be released. Yeah. Shouldn't you be expecting that to happen? Yeah. You know? Uh, and again, don't beat yourself up if you haven't been doing that because, again, these guys are living in a time of Acts where you've got all these miracles going around. I mean, for goodness gracious, it was Peter was it even raised somebody from the dead. Yeah. You know? If you, if you can... Pray without an expectancy in that kind of atmosphere. You know, cut right. yourself some slack. You know. Yeah. Uh, but again, that's that's just kind of what I one of the things I got out of this whole whole passage was mm-hmm. when you pray, there should be some expectancy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. I'm literally driving here tonight. Um, I, I felt the Lord lead me to to pray over something that I have been praying over. Um, kind of in general but in a specific way um, in the last six months or so and part of what I'm going through with that is exactly that that I prayed with some expectation but I allowed my expectations to become I filled in the blank I filled in the details this is how, this is when This is it, it's going to happen this way and it didn't and I kind of backed off praying, you know, what God had put on my heart, and, you know, went through some things, and now it's almost like some of the dust is settling in my life a bit, and and there's still this call to prayer, and it's like, 
oh, and I'm like, why well, I did that, but it didn't happen the way I thought it would happen or the way I might have wanted it to happen, but the prayer assignment is still there. And then there's the temptation, I talked about this in terms of being honest with God in the last couple of weeks, of just going, well, sure, I, I can do that. I did it before, it didn't work. I can do it now, you know, whatever. And, and that prodding of the Holy Spirit going, well, wait a minute, I wouldn't be telling you to do this to waste your breath. It didn't happen the way you thought. Doesn't mean I'm not going to do it. You, you just have to realize you're not seeing this correctly. But that's, do you genuinely have expectation that I'm going to answer? That, that that's that's a great that's a great safety rail. Yeah. <laughs> Don't allow your expectation to pull your own desires out. Right. It's that expectation that God's going to move, that He's going to answer that prayer, not how He's going to answer the prayer, or how He's going to move, or even when. In some cases. Yeah. Well, and you can do that, uh, you know, I don't think I was in King Agrippa's, you know, position where I'm going, you know, I want this for me, but circumstantially. Oh, yeah, it's just, it's easy sometimes to just go, oh, I expect it to happen this way. Well, it's almost like you look at the puzzle and you go, well, that piece has to fit here. Yeah. I mean, that makes perfect sense. That would be great. Okay, cool. And then it doesn't. You go. That's <laughs> not I made a new piece. You yeah, see it. <laughs> and I'm going. Okay, I, that didn't go how I thought it would go, and it, and so many times, <coughs> in, in most of my Christian walk, when I've had those kind of junctures, it, it's been like the Lord has said, "Hey, your heart's right. You just didn't see it. You know, you just didn't get it right." And I think that's where Peter's at too. Peter just thinks he's in the vision. <coughs> Both he and those and those people weren't really tuned in. Something had to wake them up a little. And so, once again, I draw encouragement from that to go, okay, I've prayed and thought it was going to happen a certain way. It happened differently. For them, it happened sooner than they thought. Mm -hmm. For Peter, he's thinking, well, this is just a vision. Yeah. He, he wasn't really in that place where he thought it was going to happen this way either. Um, but isn't it so cool? I, I think it's John Ortberg. Um, I, I, I kind of reread the highlights of the life uh, you always wanted again for one of these recent messages and he said how amazing is God that he's eager to listen to us when we pray even if we have absolutely ignored him all our lives and not given him the time of day and then we finally reach a crisis or we're in some foxhole or something puts us back to the wall and there's a sincere okay God you know and, and the first prayer I remember praying was kind of like that. I was 15 years old. And how awesome is God that he's listening and responding whenever we finally get serious, even if we've ignored him all our lives. And, and in the same way here that you're looking at this and they're praying, Peter's kind of going along with the angel, but neither of him or the prayers seem to be completely tuned in. Mm -hmm. And God has to kind of, you know, snap out of it. You know, the old, you know, men in skin bracer commercial. But they were praying, and God was working with them. And he, the whole, this is one whole thing I, I'm absolutely living right now. If you don't pedal the bike, you can't be steered. Yeah. you got to keep pedaling. And at least they all kept pedaling you know, where they're supposed to go. Well, I thought they were probably expecting, like, when it was the next day and the courts convened and actions happened right. that he would be released and all would be well and now no god just let him out in the middle of the night so just blew their well, that's that's exactly the kind of thing i think that tom's talking about is that's the piece they felt that yeah. that looked logical that would fall into place right. mm -hmm. to have him just suddenly go up at the gate and you know in the middle of the night yeah. oh. <laughs> And then the, the, the last thing I, I, I really struck me was, so Peter had to be woken up, remember? So it was at nighttime. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was sound asleep. Well, what was happening house. in Mary's house? There was no sleeping. Right. Had had house. So there was some dedication of intercession there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We've had all night prayer meetings here before. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe it's time to do that again. I, I remember. <laughs> John Rittenhouse and uh, and Mike Stein, we had one of those for shift destiny, I think, overnight. 
and, and somebody coined the phrase I'd never heard before, snoring in prayer, or snoring in tongues. <laughs> Can you snore in tongues? <laughs> like somebody was sitting in a corner in the sanctuary where you know they, they could kind of be braced in that corner and praying until they were snoring in tongues. But no, they were really praying in Mary's house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Poor soldiers. Just because you fell asleep on your post, you lost your head. Well, and, and not all of them were necessarily sleeping. Maybe the two that were on either side of him, or they just didn't see. God yeah. blinded their yeah. eyes. Maybe God, God just shielded their duty. Right. Therefore, they filled up their duties. Yeah, somewhere. I got the impression that the guards weren't slacking, really. I just got, uh, what was it? There? Maybe there was actually. Angel came with a cloaking device. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That's exactly yeah. Check points. Yeah. Open the exactly. gate just miraculously. Yeah, open yeah. The it's not the apostle you're looking for. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and doesn't God open our gates all the time for us? Yeah. Whether we go through them or not, it's up to us, but yeah. he makes those ways. Yeah, almost all of the special effects that really stick with us, concepts we remember like a cloaking device, there's some reality based in it. I, I, you yeah. know, I'm not sure I haven't really done a special effects Bible study, but yeah. those yeah. universal things that you go, oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, the New Living in 10 says they passed the first and second guard post, but when you look at 10, and, uh, which, it, you know, this is kind of probably inferable, but in, in the passage it says they walked on the scene, mm -hmm. passed the first guard post and then the second. Yeah. yeah. So, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't think that the guards were sleeping. I think that it's good. They were, there were some Jedi mind tricks going on. Yeah. <laughs> the Holy Spirit was hiding from them. But yeah, for Peter to be sound asleep between two soldiers, for the chains to fall off, for the angel to be talking to him, yeah, they were not perceiving what Peter was perceiving. So um, Herod had James, John's brother, killed. So then Peter says in verse 17, tell James and the other brothers what happened. So the James he's referring to in verse 17 is most likely Jesus' brother James. Yeah. And he's the one that's becoming the leader of the, of the church in, um, in Jerusalem right. at that time. The, yep. Judea. That's, and Paul refers to him as a pillar of the church. Right. Yeah, it was Jesus' half-brother. <clears throat> Cool, cool. And then uh, something that uh, Tom brought up, we were talking before. This is the last time we hear of Peter in the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting. We were kind of chatting about it, and I, I, I kind of felt like probably because Peter went to and kept preaching to the church, right? Somewhere in the heart of, of the, the mm -hmm. area there. Um, and uh, was probably doing the same things that he's been doing, but that's that was the stuff we needed to hear about again. You know, right. we need to hear about what Paul was doing. Right. Yeah. Uh, and again, that concept of you know, obviously there's aspects and facets of God that we have yet to experience and to explore mm -hmm. because we're trying to he, at least he's trying to utilize a finite book to reveal as much of himself as we need to know. Mm -hmm. So the important parts are, are in here. Mm -hmm. The things that, you know, Peter went back to keep preaching. We don't need another chapter of Peter preaching and doing miracles. We've already seen that. We need the new stuff, mm -hmm. the other facets that we haven't seen yet. Yeah, the thing I was saying to Alan, I think before we started being online, is I knew that the book of Acts shifts kind of from Peter to Paul, and then it's, it's the second half was Paul's. What I don't think I was ever conscious of is that it's this scene where he was chained, basically headed to a, you know, a, a mockery of the trial to be executed. Um, and so there's this secretive element. He gets released, you know, the angel escorts him out. He goes somewhere else, hey, send message to the church leaders, and he goes on. And so it almost, to me, in this fresh reading you know, for this week, it feels like he went underground. Mm -hmm. 
could very well be. You know, and, and so I'm not... <clears throat> I'm not really saying he was afraid and he hid because he, he obviously does ministry after this. But I've, I've never... I mean, more or less, he says, tell James I'm out. And he walks off, and if we're watching the movie, that's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he, he kind of goes into the mist out under a street light, and that's it. That's the last time that you see him in the book of Acts. And I don't, I, 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 it's one of those things I probably need to pray into because I'm going, Lord, I, I'm not sure I ever remember this scene, that that's the last we see of Peter. You know, he has this great deliverance. He goes, the whole thing with servant girl coming back and forth. Um, and that's where it is. So I'm, I'm not sure I have the, the conclusion what the bow on that is. Um, other than sometimes God shifts things for you. And you kind of leave public view a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I certainly have seen well, that in people's lives. This is also a point in time when the Christian faith is shifting out. So... You know, we even saw Peter being one of the bridges between the, the Jews and the Gentiles. Yep, in, absolutely. In a greater sense. But then as you see Paul taking that to the next step, and even out into Rome and going, going to other places, um, it almost starts to become, how do I say this, from the position of the Jewish religious leaders that were trying to persecute the Christians, trying to hold on to the old way, it almost seems like it's, the, the, the Christian problem is becoming not theirs anymore, but mm. the world's. Mm -hmm. So it, it's almost like Peter's still preaching, but he's not really clashing with them anymore. And there's, uh, that's kind of the impression I got as things mm. started to shift more to this is a, this is a world thing, not mm. just us. We don't need to deal with right. that anymore. Yeah. Kind of deal. And I, I get the feeling that's kind of what started to transpire. Because you, you start to see less and less, I think, of the Jewish, if I'm remembering right, of the Jewish religious leaders. Right. And more of the resistance that you start to get out just from where the enemy starts to try and put blockades up and twist people, you know, that are in power in, in other areas. Yeah, the, the presence of Jerusalem from here, and I'm just going by memory, Yeah. is you have the council, mm -hmm. I think is in Acts chapter 15, um, and then you have Paul come back for trial. But yeah, there's plenty of opposition once he gets out there. Oh yeah. yeah. But even Antioch, Antioch is beyond the boundary of Israel. <clears throat> um, and that becomes really the new epicenter um, where Paul is, where he launches from. Um, so Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas yeah. launch out from there. Mm -hmm. And then, um, but he deals with the same kind of issues. Jewish leaders everywhere he goes oppose him to some extent like happened in Jerusalem but Jerusalem isn't the hub anymore yeah yeah you know it moves out from there and Peter you can tell from the letters which I'm really excited to think about doing this through the New Testament sure and teaching from the letters this summer um, when you dig this deep in a chapter a week you, it, it just there's a freshness to it that you just go, wow, I'm in some context now because I've been parking in this at a pace that, you know, I'm not moving too fast, but again, we're, we're through all four Gospels. Yeah. Um, so the same the same clash is happening, but it's happening in different places. In the, yeah. With different people. The cast is changing, but the basic plot is very similar. Mm -hmm. So you're right. I, I think that's most likely the case because what you get from the rest of the New Testament is Peter was preaching to the Jews. Paul now had kind of the ministry of the Gentiles, and that actually gets articulated here, that the apostles recognized Paul's car to the Gentiles, they released him to that ministry. Um, and so Peter's probably ministering to Jews and seeing them come to faith in Jesus, probably more in that immediate vicinity around Jerusalem. Yeah, that, that resonates for me. That's, that's what I felt, too. He was, the calling, that's a good thing to point out, too, is everybody's calling is different. And right. it's not necessarily one's better than the other. Right. You know, um, you got this guy here, Peter, like, walked with Jesus physically. And, and you know, the Bible's going to pivot. So that doesn't mean that his right. his role was any less important. Yep. Or, or, or uh, in, in some way, you know, more or less than anybody else's. It's just that's, that's where that focus, he, he, that's what he was called to do. Yep. That's what Paul was called to do. 
And I've seen that same thing, and this happens in relationships to some extent. You might be close to somebody or communicate with them a lot, and then your, your paths kind of diverge, and you don't hear what's happening anymore. It doesn't mean they're not doing good work. Yeah. And I, I've seen that in our relationships and ministry, especially beyond our own church, where you draw in from somebody or you hear from somebody or you go to their conferences or you do things jointly, and then that season ends. Yeah. Um, and to you, like Peter in Luke's writing, they go off the radar. Yeah. doesn't mean that they're not doing something good. It just means they're not on the radar of your story. Yeah. Um, and again, Luke is who's writing this. So. Good. Is that when you went to go start Vatican City? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Anything else in this walk? Good stuff. You good, Dr. Pack? Yeah, I'm good. All right. Yeah, the only thing I would say about the soldiers, um, and I did a little bit of parking on this because it's it's similar with um, Jesus's resurrection. Suddenly, have Roman soldiers who couldn't oppose God. <laughs> you know, God proved that He was bigger than them. Um, you want to be careful who you align with, mm. because if you align with people and forces that are not in the purposes of God, that's who you're putting yourself in the hands of. Um, and, I, and, you know, in contrast <coughs> here, where these guys technically don't do their job because God beats them <coughs> in the game, um, in contrast to um, Cornelius, you know, who flowed in the purposes of God, even though he also was a Roman soldier. So, you, you just want to be careful with that because when you're under the command of somebody who is not in the purposes of God, bad things can happen. You know, we, we've seen that in our own lives uh, and sometimes have you know, been connected to or worked for people who just didn't want to do the right thing. I, I know Kim had some jobs where it was like, you know, you don't want to be under the authority of somebody who is, is not dealing in a way that is going to be healthy and have a godlike response and a shepherding attitude towards you as an employee. Yeah. And it's like, no, no, let's get you out of there. <laughs> you know? Oh, and, and this is an interesting thing too because um, you know if you if you read this and you're, and you're kind of new to walking with Jesus, you might think the wrong thought here because it wasn't God that killed those soldiers. Right. It was Herod that killed those soldiers. That's right. Yes. It was an unholy man's response to a miracle. Right. The wrong response to a miracle. That's right. That killed those men. Yeah. Um, you well, know, and his, and his heart and his free will and, and that kind of stuff. And like you said, that those men, they, they aligned themselves and put their lives right. in the hands of Herod, who clearly is a man that was not all there in the head if he's killing James just because... Oh, this is going to be make fun. Some popular, yeah. yeah. Make me popular. Yeah. Well, and, and that's life is messy. Life is complicated, and when when we want, especially when we suffer loss and grief, we want simple answers. Yeah. And the reality is, God didn't make life to be simple. We're not simple. Life is not simple. God is not simple. Um, I read a headline today on CBN News about this earthquake in, T in Turkey and Syria. It's and it's, it's a little bit like 9-11 from this point of view, that there's so many testimonies of people who've been delivered. Yeah. There's, right now, there's more people who've been rescued out of the rubble than died. Just like on 9-11, there's all these stories of the subway being slow, people calling in sick, people couldn't get on the, mm. on the grounds of the World Trade Center in time. And, and they thought it was a problem, and so there's all these people who were spared, mm -hmm. but not everybody got spared. You know, somebody gets healed from cancer, and you want to celebrate it, and I've been at ministry long enough to know that person is sitting here, and their loved one didn't beat cancer. How does this testimony work for them? You know, my, my son did heroin, and he made it out alive. I have friends whose children did heroin and did not make it out alive, um, and so... We need to be careful to not say, you know, 
God delivered my loved one or God delivered this person I cared about with an implication being God didn't deliver yours, what was wrong. Life is just complicated um, and it's not always easily explained. So these guys die. Was that a just thing? Again, I think there's a lesson you want to be careful who you put yourself under. Yeah. Well, there's also the, um, the what did we see happening is there's a testimony happening to the Roman soldiers throughout the Gospels. Right. You know, there's Roman soldiers who, being around Jesus and seeing the miracles, it's, you know, it's well, drawing them to the faith. Yeah, yeah speaking of that, and then we have, I'm remembering this right, didn't, didn't Paul have his chains fall off and the doors open up? Yeah. And Paul the guards and were terrified. Paul yeah. Paul and he Barney said, don't worry, Paul we're still Silas. here. We didn't leave. Right. Yeah, Paul and, and Silas. And, and they, they, had a, they had a ministry <coughs> with those guards. Yes, that's right. right. And the whole household gets saved. Yeah. 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 The jailer and his whole family gets saved. But they saved. knew what was going to happen if the prisoners were gone. <laughs> As I said, the guards were terrified. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, so, you know, why sometimes and not others? Yeah. I don't always have those answers. Again, the longer I walk with the Lord and the more I watch real life unfold, instead of the macro explanations, I look for the goodness of God. And, it, and, and really, that's the kind of thing that should drive us to a closer partnership with, with Jesus Christ. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because just those two differences in those two things. Right. You know, angel led, led Peter out. Um, the Holy Spirit freed Free Paul and, and and Paul made his decision on where he was going to go from there. Right. Yeah, so there's yeah there's a difference in, in, in that that you can only determine not through like you say an equation or a formula. Right. It's but exactly right. From that that intimate partnership yeah, with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And it's about God being with you in whatever situation you're in, not that your circumstances are the way that you would write the ticket. Mm -hmm. um, again, that's. I was saying this on stage recently, and it's I'm doing a lot of preaching out of my own personal experience <coughs> currently. <laughs> it's not there's a lot of stuff that is I'm going. This is not theoretical. That I literally had the impression at one point. I, I'm I'm not sure I know how to articulate this too clearly, but some things didn't work the way I thought, and I'm I'm like, and it's when God said, "No, pray it out loud." Because it looks like you're you're working harder than me. It looks like you're more faithful than I am. And I'm like, I'm really, really and God's like, no, 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 come on, say it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, uh, it looks like I've been doing this, and, and I've been praying what you told me to pray. I've been doing what you told me to do, and I'm not getting the results that I thought were pr pretty clearly implied. And God's like, great. It looks like you're more faithful than me. It looks like you're working harder than me. Mm -hmm. Right? Tell it. Go ahead, and I'm like, okay, Lord, from a certain point of view, and God's like, right, which means that point. Do you believe that? Do you believe you're more faithful than me, that you're working harder than me? No, God, I do not. That means your point of view is, is incomplete at best. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the midst of that, I have this sense. I'm driving, and it's like God is right in the passenger seat. He's right here. He's as good as he's ever been, and he'll talk to me about almost anything I want to talk about. But there are a couple of subjects that he's not going to discuss. <laughs> he's having a boundary with you. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to unpack that with you. And again, I've learned this walking with folks at the end of life. The, the first person that I probably ever sat on a deathbed with, I was like, okay, Lord, how long? How's this going to go? You know, you declare the end from the beginning. God's like, oh, I'm, I don't tell in situations like that. You know, you're in good company because Jesus said, I don't even know what to right. You know, mm -hmm. so, so he, you go, he didn't tell Jesus everything either. <laughs> right. So is God right with me? I believe he is. Is he still good? I believe he is. Is he, is he willing to talk to me about many, many, many things? Absolutely. Are there some subjects he can choose to go? You don't need to know that. Yeah. He's allowed. Yeah. Again, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't need to give him permission. I work for him. He doesn't work for me. And, um, and, and same thing here, interpreting these. And why, why did this one go down this way? This one go down this way? I don't know. So why, so why did James get killed and Peter got rescued? Got rescued. That's exactly right. You know, was it God's will for James to get killed? You know? So this came up in my group today, actually, in my IOP group today. That, one, one that guy actually was, touches on the hand grenade I was going to throw in later. Well, one guy in my IOP group gave his testimony today because he was um, 
graduating from IOP. Wow. And he um, gave his story, and he said, you know, I should have died hundreds of times in all of the drug use I've been doing. I never overdosed, and I never had one of those experiences. And all the times I used and I should have died. And I don't know why I didn't die, but I saw friends around me die. I think there had to be, the only explanation there can be is that God spared me for some reason, and I don't know why. And another guy said, well, was it God's will for your friends to die? And if it was God's will to rescue you, was it God's will for your friends to die? And the guy said, I don't know. Good answer. And he said, I don't know, but I know that it should have been me, and I didn't die. So all I know is that there must be some reason for that, and I'm going to seek God to find out what that reason is. And I thought, wow, this is getting deep in here, you know? Yeah. And um, I said, we work for him. He doesn't work for us. He doesn't owe us an explanation, you know? So some people were in there scratching their heads and skeptical, and other people are going, I've had, you know, stuff happen to me yeah. there's no explanation for. Yeah. So. <clears throat> I've also recently had some stuff or when I look back, I realize I was ignoring some prodding from the Holy Spirit. Something bad happened. Yeah. You know, yeah. Somebody brought just, that up too. That was that was me being stupid and just deciding to do my own thing anyway. You know. Yeah. So. Yeah. I came out in the group. One of the guys said, "Yeah, I had a really bad uh, motorcycle accident, and I should have died, but I know that I had the accident because I was in rebellion against God. I promised God that I would stop using drugs and stuff." And I went back and did it again, and then I had this bad motorcycle accident. And I know now that that was God giving me a wake-up call. God was giving me another chance, so I'm not going back out there again, or mm. I think I'll die. Mm. Here's, here's the thing I think that it's hard for us. It's hard for us collectively, I think, sometimes to internalize and to really own the concept of, is that I believe God has an intimate, personal relationship with each person on an individual basis. And your relationship with Jesus is different than my relationship. Mm -hmm. And it's always going to be different. Mm -hmm. There's going to be some overarching concepts that are always going to be the same. Yes. But the, the interaction, the relationship is different. And so to say, why did this happen to this person and not to this person? Their relationship with Jesus is, whether you want to admit it or not, completely right. different than yours. Yeah. You know? And so yeah. there's stuff you don't even know about. I mean, if there are stuff in married couples, relationships that we don't know about, uh, how much more intimate mm -hmm. and how much more secrets are there between Jesus and some other person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, that's you know? right. That's good. We're not privy to that information. Yeah. <laughs> and yet we still want to put it all in a formula. We yeah. still want to put it all together. We want to, talk. we want to be individual when we want to be individual. But right. when things aren't going right, we want, we want to bunch it all together and say, how come this formula didn't stress you get it wrong? Yeah. Life's not like that, like, like, like Tom said. Yeah. Do you think that maybe sometimes where there's a death and not a death and the circumstances are so close to the same thing and why did this one die and why didn't that one, that maybe somebody got to heaven and was offered a choice and decided to stay in heaven? Like they, they could have had a resurrection, could have had a healing, could have had a redemption of a situation and just said, yeah, the family would do without me, I'm staying, this is awesome. Yeah. And they just chose to stay. Yeah. So it wasn't that God failed, but we, we don't give our loved ones grace enough to right. say, if you like where you are, fine. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll get through it. But we just yeah. figured God. I remember the testimony of, of Smith Wigglesworth, where his wife died, and he prayed and said, I got to have her back, God. And God let her come back. And she said, Smith, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I wanted you back. I, and she, she said, no, it's your turn to take on the ministry. Now I'm going to go be with, with Jesus. So say goodbye to me, and let's be on with this. And now it's your turn to minister. And he said goodbye to her, and she left again. <laughs> See? Yeah. Laurie Westwood, who has preached here, she used to be the regional director for Sozo, and now she's just like a full-time grandmother, mm -hmm. um, taking her grandbabies on horses, if you're f friends with her on Facebook. <laughs> Um, really got messed up a bit when her dad died. Her dad died when she was pretty young. And he was a work with your hands kind of guy. He wasn't very affectionate and didn't say I love you a lot. So he had a different love language than she did. And in a, a sozo time, um, God showed her a vision of he's sick in the bed 
and I, I can't remember if he had cancer or he had something that would have been a major fight should he have stayed and, and fought for healing. And the Lord appeared to him in, in this vision that Laurie is saying and said, if you want to be done, you can be done. Or, you know, we can, we can stay here and fight for this. And he said, no, I'm, I'm good. I, I don't need to stay and fight. My family's going to be fine. I know that they're all on the right path. They're provided for. Um, I, I've worked really hard. I'm, I don't want to stay here and just fight this and, and do chemo or whatever the treatment was. Right. You know, I'm good. And, and it, it was such a healing to Laurie to see that and went, oh, my dad chose to, okay, I have the opportunity to go to heaven. Okay, yeah, no, I'm good. I'm good. Um, and that's one of the things, our, our friend Robert Muncy, who is Lori's pastor, um, they really have pressed into healing to the point where they went to the morgue one time to pray for somebody. I mean, they, they stepped mm -hmm. out further than I could have stepped out. <coughs> and I've watched Robert, you know, he's a good friend, and I've watched him grapple with some of this stuff. And where he's come to at this point in his journey, and he'll say this, is I think we have more say in all this than we believe. We believe that death happens to us. And he said, I, I believe even in that last season, God partners with us, and there's choices we can make with him um, about some of that. And he said, obviously, it's shrouded in a bit of mystery still, but I don't know. I, I, I know this, and I learned this on my first, first deathbed. God wants to be involved. You know, for, for us who became believers and, and really active in ministry and college ministry where you don't do funerals, you yeah. do weddings and baby dedications. That's all you do. <laughs> I did my first funeral here at Harvest. I was pastor three months and I had a funeral. And um, God really wants to be present when people are passing. Uh, uh, you know, if they're his kid, he wants to really pour out on them. If they're not his kid yet, he wants to just be so good to them that they surrender at the end. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen it go both ways and some flavors in between. Mm -hmm. So we, we do have some say in it, and it is that individual thing. Peter, being restored in John 21, and Jesus is telling him how he's going to die one day. Mm -hmm. And he looks at John and goes, well, what about him? <laughs> and Jesus basically says, it's none of your business. Right. You know, if, if I want him with me, that's how it'll be. And then Peter misinterprets that, you know, and, and the disciples say, well, he'll, he's never going to die. And John was hard to kill, to quote, you know, a book that we read recently. He was hard to kill. Mm -hmm. Finally, they just exiled him because they could never kill him. <laughs> so, I mean, how, get this guy out of here. how strange is that? Yeah. But again, like, like Paul, if I can write and send you stuff, I can still minister to you. Fox's Book of Martyrs has a lot of interesting information about the apostles and about what happened you know it's, it's a pretty powerful read yeah mm -hmm. and God works in some of that I mean Paul I'm not saying that good on it yeah Paul got to minister in prison you know in what was the epicenter of the world you know who knows what happened from that I mean there he is in Caesar's house preaching to people yeah yeah who knows <clears throat> interesting right. stuff so what's your theological bomb you're going to drop? Or do we want to do the last section and oh, then okay. drop Oh, bomb? we didn't read it. Or did Pastor Kim beat you to the hand grenade once again? I'm sorry. <laughs> didn't mean to. I didn't mean to do that. Stand. Last section? Yes. All right, 20 to 25 to the end. Herod. Hmm? Herod. Herod. Yes, it's Herod. I'm not sure why you're having such a hard time. I'm not sure why. You had trouble with Herod, but you got interrogated. Yeah, right. I was, I was like, wow, okay. Yeah. English. I thought it was a good job, but it just. You're right. making fun of me. No. You're making fun with you, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> now, Herod was very angry with the people of Tyre Tyr and, si and Sidon. So they sent a delegation mm -hmm. to make peace with them because their cities were dependent with upon Herod's country for food. The delegates, delegates mm -hmm. won the support of Blastus, Herod's personal assistant, and an appointment with Her Herod the What's great. was granted. When the day had arrived, Herod put on his royal robes, sat on his throne, and made a speech to them. The people gave him a great 
ovation, shouting, It's the voice of God, not of man! Instantly an angel of the Lord struck Herod with a sickness because he accepted the people's worship instead of giving the glory to God. So he was consumed with worms and died. Meanwhile, the word of God continued to spread, and there were many new believers. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission in Jerusalem, they returned, taking John and Mark with them. So here we go. We're going to pick back up with Herod. Um, and it was interesting because this really ties into, uh, remember with Barnabas and, and Saul, we were up there, um, and this band, remember, the guy stood up and said there's going to be a famine, and they took an offering. Yep. Well, when you, when you read through and look at some of the stuff that's happened there, um, and especially uh, the footnote here in the Passion, is that the Aramaic can be translated as they wanted cultivated land, which makes sense if their food supply was running out. Here we see the beginnings of this famine is starting, and these people are coming to Herod to try and get into the get race to the certain land to go ahead and start to hopefully feed themselves. Um, and of course, so then he's got to make a big, we already figured out he was a political dude, right? Because he's pandering to get glory for himself. So now he makes his big speech and I, I don't know, this must have been a really good speech. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> uh, possibly it was a good speech with the end of it being we're going to give you a bunch of food and you're going to live. You know, so right. I, I don't know what, I, because in my head I'm going, what? Who who has a speech where people go, this is the voice of God? Yeah, there's that's that was a pretty good one, right? Mm -hmm. So suddenly they're like, oh, this is this is this is God. So they start trying to worship him, and he says, give me more of that. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they're just trying to flatter him, Second right? Thanks. Yeah. Maybe they're just trying to flatter him, and he accepts the flatter as worship. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. This. <laughs> That scenario, I'm not sure there was any sincerity <laughs> on anybody's part. No. The voice of a God. Really? Yeah. No, I just want... I, I just, just want some food. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want his political favor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, God will judge the heart, good or bad. Mm -hmm. And so instantly an angel struck here down with the sickness. And I, I, I heard someone told me that Pastor Kim likes the, the worm thing. <laughs> yeah. Have some insight on Herod being eaten by worms. I I don't. What's my insight? I don't remember. So, I just you know, it's dramatic. Yeah, it's very dramatic. And I mean, I know I've preached about this before. Um, I think it was you know, so many ways to strike someone. Yeah, down most likely worms. it was real worms. I mean, most likely it was. Real parasites. Parasites, yeah. It real just parasites. Have all blossomed at that one instant and totally yeah. took his life. That's exactly what you, th you think happened is, um, you know, you could have intestinal parasites or something like that, and, you know, you struck with it by an angel at that moment. Heart worms. Well, here's, here's Jack Hayford's mm -hmm. slightly less dramatic take. Okay. Luke's account of Herod's unusual death is corroborated by the first century Jewish historian Josephus. Neither Luke nor Josephus gives enough details to determine the exact medical cause of the divine judgment incurred. It may have been peritonitis or an intestinal obstruction. He was consumed with words and dyes, references the humiliation surrounding his death, not the means of his demise. Mm -hmm. So basically... So he could have had really severe diarrhea. <laughs> One minute he's a guy, the next minute... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe vomiting that. and diarrhea. Maybe yeah. vomiting and diarrhea at the same time. Um, well, again, I, I just taught on Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Mm -hmm. One of the things Elijah says to the prophets of Baal is, maybe, maybe your God is off in the bathroom. Yeah. And he can't hear you. Yeah. And uh, so, if you think the Bible's not <laughs> real, you know, yeah. kind of street level, sometimes it's not there. But again, God judges the heart. It, I, I'm not sure I ever saw that before. Killing Christians, well, Saul was just doing that a couple chapters ago. He turns into the greatest apostle in history. Agrippa, not so much. Yeah. You know, but it was a battle heart issue. And, um, Historically, well, and, he wasn't a true Jew. He 
he was a, de a descendant of Esau's, from what something else I was reading. Anyway, and because he wasn't fully <coughs> Jewish, it was important for him to get the acceptance mm. to rule the Jewish community. Mm. So as much as he was vain, etc., it was really important for him to get that level sure. of respect from them mm -hmm. in order to rule, to keep Rome happy, to keep the peace, to keep the seat. Right, all the dominoes in place. You know, but... Well, and, and we see this, you know, the tension all through the Gospels between the Roman leaders and the, and the Jewish religious leaders. And mm -hmm. quite often, somebody who's somewhat Jewish being made king mm -hmm. and kind of in between the two. Um, but again, God will, will test our hearts no matter what. So who had more ruling power, the Sanhedrin or the king? Well, the Sanhedrin was over religious I stuff. Know, stuff. But yeah. really run the people, the Sanhedrin. Oh, the Romans king. did. And Herod was just Ultimately. the, you know, the pawn for the Romans. Well, the, the Romans were the, the thugs. They were the enforcement. Right. Um, you get the impression that the Herods, and there were multiple Herods, were essentially the administrators. They ran the day to day. I was about to say most of the the, the, the Romans ruled, but if they decreed something, they usually sent it down and had Herod executed. Right. Right. Yeah, you know, they didn't actually they didn't actually keep huge. He's a puppet king. Huge crop, swaths right. of armies everywhere. Right. You know, they expected him to carry out their yeah. orders. And of course, if he didn't, then they would send some armies over to him to right. knock on his door and find out why he didn't do it. But but even, you know, one of the things we learned recently was that there were actually two high priests, you know, at the time with Jesus, and it wasn't supposed to be that way. Yeah. Because um, one didn't want to give up the power, so yeah, they no, ended up having two different ones. Just like, you know, when, when the Pope brought his children out on the balcony to show everybody, you just go, I don't think it was supposed to go that way. Yeah. So th this, is, this is my little hand grenade. And, okay. and Kim kind of touched on it a little bit. Like we talked about it a little bit, but I, I call it hearing it because I don't, don't necessarily have an answer. I just this is a thought that popped up. So Herod King kills James. James and John were the first disciples of Jesus. Walk, walk with Jesus. Kills, kills James. And God doesn't strike him down. Mm. Right. A couple of verses later, he gives a speech, accepts the worship of God. And God strikes him down. To us, that might seem a little lopsided, right? Mm -hmm. Especially to maybe James's mom. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why did you wait, Lord? Why did you wait? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why wasn't there retribution? You know. And I know part of it is uh, a large piece of it touches on that concept of you know another thing that didn't make it through the cross is we fight. We don't fight flesh and blood. That's right. Right. Not, not in the new covenant. Yeah. Um, and I know it also touches on free will on some some areas for yeah. some stuff. And it's also about you know again we touched about this concept in a couple of chapters of, yeah about stealing God's glory. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, but again, I don't necessarily know that I have an answer to that question. There's just something that popped up because there's two two incidences that are right within the same chapter. Yep. You know, like you say, book ending. Yep. You know, the prison break care. Um, and so it's just one of those things like, and we touched about it a few minutes ago, you were talking about mm -hmm. you know, one person gets, doesn't, you know, gets saved out of a drug, and another person has a, an overdose. Right. Right. I don't, I don't know that I have an answer to it. It's just that was one of the things that popped out. And, yeah. You know. Well, here's, a, here's what I propose. And you can see evidence of this throughout the scriptures where God is dealing with a king or dealing with a leader and perhaps God was working on Herod's heart and maybe gave him a dream. Maybe he felt shame and guilt for having killed John and maybe God was giving him time to repent. Maybe God was giving him a moment to, you know, maybe he sent an angel to Herod to bring, you know, conviction to his heart. Possibly. Well, and he rejected it and received the worship instead of giving the glory to God. And God said, that's it, that's my last straw, you're done. <laughs> that's not entirely possible. The, the other thing that did pop into my head, and this is, I hesitate to say it because I don't want to sound callous or cruel, but I firmly believe that James is in heaven with Jesus. Oh, yeah. 
So it's almost, and again, you, you just take it with a grain of salt and bear with me on it. But at, at, I keep coming back to it though. I just keep coming back to that concept. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Right, right, right. right. And, and that concept of now James got to come home, him being killed was messed up, wasn't probably the greatest thing. Right. But in the grand scheme of things, James is okay. Right. Yeah. Not that big of a deal. Right. Uh, you know what I mean? I'm not, I, again, I didn't want to say it that way. But the, you know what I mean? That, Interesting. That well, there's a big picture. The big picture. James in is in a eternity. better place. He's, he's, yes. he's, his job's done now. He's, he's partying. You know, he's waiting for us and cheering us on. And I know that doesn't didn't console his mom. Right. And I'm not trying to see him like God, God didn't care about that. He does. Right. But again, you, looking at the grand scheme of things, yep. what Herod's doing at the end of the chapter is much more, much worse from many different angles. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. that kind of thing is poisonous mm -hmm. and tends to seep into other. We're so easy <laughs> for us to slide down that slope of getting that big head and that ego, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm the guy, I'm the guy, and then you cross that line thinking you're, you're the God, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I, I think that that's a much bigger infestation if you will mm -hmm. much bigger problem that needs to be cut off mm -hmm. um, it's a big public spectacle lesson he's a muckety muck he's a king and he takes the glory from God and yeah. that's the end of that and mm -hmm. so you're not safe and, and all the people listening and blowing sunshine up his robe etc are just like oh my what's going on here you know, it's it's. And, just, I, and it's, I'm trying to have compassion. You know, I've lost people. My mom died, and I, mm -hmm. I just, mm -hmm. I. It's weird how when you go through a traumatic event, mm -hmm. how certain pieces of time seem to solidify in your memory. Mm -hmm. yep. I am so. It's crystal clear. We were visiting my mom, and you were there, and we were both walking out of the Cook ER door at the same time. <clears throat> and you were saying something about it, and in my heart, I felt the Holy Spirit, and I just felt like she's not getting better. That's why I was confused when she, my mom started to get better, and then she went down again. And then right. Mm -hmm. she, uh, she never actually got home, but they moved her to a uh, different awesome. care, yeah, yeah, I remember their place, and then then she went down and they went back, and then, um, but I remember cl I was crystal clear walking out with you were on my left side, and we were talking about it, and I remember in my heart thinking. I just feel in. like she's not getting going to come home from yeah. us. Which was crazy because she broke an ankle. Right. Three guys out right. on the internet. It doesn't wire. seem Who to dies make any from a broken sense. ankle? Yeah. But I mean, does it make any sense? So I, I'm not saying this from a position that has never lost anyone, but I know for a fact my mom is in heaven with Jesus right now, mm -hmm. and in a much better place than where she was mm -hmm. um, when she was here. And as we walked through that process, there was a point where I actually was able to come to the, the grip that. Even if she was somehow almost like what you were talking about with with, um, with uh, Laura, mm -hmm. Laura, the, the, the quality of life that she would have been, she right. would have would have been not. She would never have chosen that for herself, right? Mm -hmm. You know, yep. and so I can easily see her having that conversation with God and, mm -hmm. and her saying, "No, I'm 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 okay. I'm done." Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, yeah, that concept of in in the grand scheme of things that was important to God I'm important to God but it was that's part of life here mm -hmm. as much as we don't want to admit it mm -hmm. you know that's just that's just part of what happens with us <coughs> so here killing James wasn't enough right to have an angel striking down you know well again we've articulated everybody's relationship with God as individual mm -hmm. whether you're a believer or not yeah yeah, yeah. And my, my sense in just reading the story is the idea of you fill a cup and then the cup is full. You know, the scripture is pretty clear that the Holy Spirit won't strive with people forever. That there comes a point where kind of the cup is full. And it, that was the sense that I have is that, you know, his cup's filling. He's seeing miracles. God is proving that he's in charge, not Herod. I can set people free that you intend to harm. Mm -hmm. But he didn't. He didn't bend the knee. Yeah. <clears throat> now it's just like God that in the last moments of, of consciousness, last throes of death, that Herod could have said, "I'm sorry," and could he be in heaven? Right. We don't know. Could be. 
Nebuchadnezzar, you know, I mean, you can see all throughout the scriptures that God works on the king's hearts. You know, I mean, what about um, Pontius Pilate? You know, I mean, his wife has a dream, and all of this stuff, he washes his hands, and he's like, <coughs> you can see that God was working out. on the guy's he heart. He wants out, and he can't get out. And he can't get out. God's, <coughs> God's working on hey, his heart. The, the new covenant he <coughs> opened up with, Excuse me. I'm sorry, right as he was, as the, the thief was dying on the cross with him. So right. the, the new covenant opened it up with that kind of concept. So here it could be. We don't yeah. know. We don't know. He, he, you know. We don't know. Could, so again, God, be, God is with each of us. Yeah. And God wants to work with us. And, and I'm, I'm becoming more and more convinced afresh that there's just pieces of this we don't see. Mm -hmm. And we need to trust him. And there's, there's going to be some things we don't get answers to. I don't need answers. I need him to be with me in it. Yeah. You know? I, I need him to walk through the valley of the shadow of death with me. I don't need mm -hmm. him to explain why mm -hmm. that's where I'm at. Because um, we're just not always going to get answers. Answers aren't what matters the most. God didn't create us to explain every last detail yeah. to us. He created us to be with us. Four year olds, three year olds. Why? 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 Why is the sky blue? Why is the grass green? Why is there air? And, and you know, it's cool to figure that stuff out. I mean, science is an amazing thing, but there has to come a point where, like the wean child, we just rest on him and don't right. fuss anymore. And I think that's what he's looking for. So, again, he is complex, to say the least. We are complex. Life is complex. Mm -hmm. Death is complex. There is no simple answers to all of this. And when that's what we're looking for, it, it's proof that we're trying to reduce something that can't be reduced. Right. And, and we do it out of our grief and our loss. But God's well, the, bigger than all that. The thief on the cross always gives me encouragement in he didn't go through all the steps that everybody says you have to go through. Yep, right. You know, he didn't get baptized in water. Yep. We don't know that he did. We never hear anything about it. Right. You Most know, likely not. all he does is, you know, say, "Remember me, Jesus." Yeah, just remember me, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, "Today you'll be with me in paradise." Yeah. That's all it took. You know, there's whole denominations that are based on you have to do these steps. You have to be baptized this way. You have to this and that. You know, you can't be saved without this, this, and this, and the other. You know. We do like to come up with our own rules and stuff. For unbaptized babies. Right. Yeah. 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 There's all kinds of well, rules there and are, regulations. Yeah, there that are churches kind of... that baptize the baby fast in case the baby <laughs> dies. Right. And it's like, mm, it's not the water. Right. Good stuff. I don't usually do this, but just as a kind of summary here, for me, there were two main things that really stood out this chapter. First is that God looks at our hearts. can't really, can't fool them. You can be a politician, you can speak mm -hmm. as good as you want, you can um, hide behind the internet, you can hide however you want to do, you can you know, do your Facebook and only post the good stuff and hide the bad stuff, but God knows your heart and, and can't hide that from him. And then the other big thing that's just to me is um, intercession is important and powerful and works. Mm -hmm. And we should be doing more of it. That's good. Amen. Amen. Get end early. It's alright. Right, right on time. Right this minute. We're right on time. We're right yeah, we're, we're, just we're like God. a couple seconds earlier. Yeah, if we want to, you know, can we scoot in there that way? Bible study is like a wizard. <laughs> Tom, you want to close this out? Sure. Father, we do say thanks for your word. It is alive. It is living and active. It does like that sword come between our soul and spirit, the parts of us that are just us and those parts of us that you live in. Father, we pause tonight and just worship you and honor you and say you are great above anything we can really conceive and you are working in all the details. You can do whatever you want and we believe, God, even in the ups and downs that you are with us, you'll never leave us or forsake us and you're always good. So, Father, we say thanks for that, that you are looking into our hearts. Um, and, God, that our, our prayer and our partnership with you matters um, and gets stuff done. So, Father, I, I pray for those who are connected with this broadcast, for those of us in the room, that that sense of you being greater than all, beyond comprehension, and yet wanting to partner with us will be there. That all, that wonder, and the simplicity of, of childlike faith 
both things are true. And I pray that you'll help us walk in that in our own assignments. Peter goes kind of off the exit stage left, and we don't see him anymore in this book. So whether it's in public view or obscurity that we're serving you, um, I pray that we will and uh, walk with you in obedience. We just say thanks for all of it tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Same, same bad channel next week, right?